Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Navigating yourself through the real estate maze can be quite daunting. And right now there's a lot of foreclosures and short sales. What exactly are these? With me is John Bradbury, and he is going to help explain the quagmire of real estate as far as foreclosures and short sales. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. What exactly is the definition of a short sale? Well, essentially a short sale is what someone would take advantage of in lieu of a foreclosure. Essentially, if someone is no longer has the capabilities of paying their mortgage, they are looking at either a foreclosure, perhaps a bankruptcy. A short sale is an alternative to a foreclosure proceeding. Typically in the past, when someone has suffered an economic harm that, allowed, that renders them unable to continue their loan payments, the owner of the property would have sold that property, taken whatever equity was remaining in the property, paid off their loan, and, and continued on with their lives. Unfortunately, the double whammy, if you will, that's gone on these days is that deflating property values have rendered, it una rendered sellers unable to pay their mortgages off with the proceeds that result from the sale. Then what happens then? Do they go into bankruptcy? Do they file? Does it become foreclosed? What's the next step? Well, if someone is unable to pay their mortgage, the bank is inclined to foreclose on the property. And what the bank is doing when they foreclose on the property is they're going to retake possession of the property and sell the property in an effort to recoup their, their mortgage amount, the outstanding indebtedness on the property. A short sale is, occurs when someone does not have the requisite uh, sales proceeds to pay off the loan in full. For an example, if there was a million dollar home that was purchased several years ago and a $900,000 mortgage was taken on and the current fair market value of that property is below the 900000 then they will not have enough proceeds to sell that property into, in the open market and realize enough money to pay off the bank. And a short sale is essentially a negotiation with the bank for the bank to release the lien on the property for less than what it is owed. Somebody realizes that they do not have enough cash flow or even cash to make their monthly mortgage. What is the best scenario for them to put it on the market and get a short sale or go into foreclosure? Well, there, that's a very big difference. A foreclosure ha offers very little, if any, benefit uh, to the owner of the property. Uh, foreclosure is a severe and long-standing credit event that basically has a very comparable effect to a bankruptcy proceeding in, in terms of how it affects one's credit report and credit score. What a foreclosure, what a, in lieu of a foreclosure, someone can engage a short sale, engage the bank in negotiation, and what the bank will do is they will want to look towards the fair market value of the property, and that's the big difference with respect to a short sale. With a short sale, the bank is looking at it from the perspective of the loss mitigation group or the workout group of the bank is not looking at the outstanding indebtedness on the property, but rather what is their offer today as opposed to what they could ultimately realize if they take the property back through foreclosure and through foreclosure the whole process of uh, 30, 60, 90 days delinquent, having the property brought into a foreclosure can take in excess of a year. And if that's vigorously defended, um, by a foreclosure action is vigorously defended by the owner of the property, that can take well in excess of a year. So the bank has several motivations. Number one, the bank is going to realize the benefit of the sales price at foreclosure. And that has nothing to do with the outstanding indebtedness that's on the property. Um, number two, the Fair market value is what's relevant from the bank's decision-making perspective from the loss mitigation group. And it will have, it will bear the risk of deflating prices 
during the time that the foreclosure proceeding takes place. That's one motivation for the bank. Uh, the, the risk of falling prices are continuing, uh, prices continuing to fall. That's number one. Number two, the bank has to put aside a loss reserve as soon as that bank uh, or that loan amount becomes non-performing or the loan is non-performing. And that constitutes the principal balance, the accruing interest, the foreclosure expenses, for the buyer, the foreclosure expenses, uh, attorney fees, the attorney fees on the sale of the property, the brokerage fees at the sale of the property, and all of those amounts need to be put into a loss reserve, which will stay for uh, the period of the loan. So it's much more than just the outstanding principal balance that has to be set aside for the loss reserve. And those loss reserves that are set aside, those are monies that are essentially put on a shelf. And those monies would otherwise be utilized in the bank issuing more loans and making more money. So that's the second reason why a bank would be interested in pursuing a short sale. The third is probably the most critical. In New York State, all first mortgages are non-recourse. And what that means, in a non-recourse loan, the bank cannot go after the borrower after the foreclosure. So if we use the example from earlier, where a property was purchased that cost a million dollars with a $900,000 loan. If there's $700,000 is what the bank would realize at foreclosure, the bank does not have the opportunity to go back to the borrower for that shortfall of $200,000. Again, that's only on first mortgages in New York that they're non-recourse, but um, second loans are. Home equity lines of credits would be uh, provide the bank with recourse. And the, third, the fourth uh, motivation for a lender to pursue a short sale would be that there is contemplating now in Congress a change to the bankruptcy provision which would allow bankruptcy judges to cram down or reduce the principal amounts that are owed on mortgages. That cram down amount would not be something that the bank would agree to. It would be something that the bank would be forced to accept through a bankruptcy judge. So there are four reasons that the banks are motivated to endure in and encourage short sales. Um, and there are obviously the motivations for the seller are to save and salvage their credit report and also um, to have some peace of mind by inserting a go-between between, between themselves and the lender. How does the foreclosure and a bankruptcy differ? Well, a bankruptcy procedure is a, when a creditor seeks to obtain protection from their creditors through the federal government. And the federal government has allowed for uh, some form of bankruptcy way back when, uh, when the country was founded. People should realize that bankruptcy is nothing to be ashamed of. Bankruptcy is a business decision. If someone is going to spend five or ten years clawing their way out of debt, they should realize that they're probably going to have severe impact on their on their retirement savings and how they can provide for their retirement as well as the the remainder of of their day-to-day -day lives. If bankruptcy offers, um, if bankruptcy is something that that serves a benefit to a creditor, it's not something that should be viewed as an as an emotional uh, decision. It should really be viewed as a business decision. Um, and it offers protections from credit card debt and to some extent uh, possibly mortgage debt um, as well as a variety of different debts. A foreclosure proceeding is limited to just the home and the, the retaking of the bank, uh, by the bank of the property. So that's the difference between a foreclosure and a bankruptcy proceeding. Let's go back to a short sale. Mm -hmm. When should somebody start the process of doing a short sale? As soon as someone anticipates that they are going to be unable to pay their mortgage, they should begin to negotiate a short sale. Um, first and foremost, delinquencies on mortgage payments or in any type of indebtedness will have a negative effect on credit report by and of itself. So the best way to avoid uh, or the best way to have as little an impact on a credit report as possible is to begin the process and to negotiate a short sale without having ever been delinquent in a payment. Who do they approach first? The bank, their attorney, or a real estate broker? That's a great question. Um, 
you would approach a real estate broker um, once you've come to the decision that you want to put the property on the market. Um, whether or not someone needs to contact an attorney, certainly people can negotiate directly with the banks themselves. There's no reason that there's a requirement to hire an attorney to, to work on a short sale on b behalf of a creditor or a borrower. I think that if you, it's a road that's, that has a lot of pitfalls in it, and certainly it's helpful if you've experienced it before, um, but I think that the combination of when a buyer or when an owner is aware that they are not going to be capable of paying their mortgage because of loss of job, because of loss of income of some sort, um, they should begin the short sale negotiation immediately. Now, what exactly is involved in a short sale? Regrettably, there's talking to workout divisions f with major lenders. If there's a first and second mortgage, there would be a negotiation with both the primary and the home equity line of credit lender. Ideally, those would be one and the same, but if they're different, there's a negotiation that takes place with both of them. Um, those negotiations take months. Regrettably, the workout divisions of major lenders are overwhelmed because of the, everything that's going on in the economy. Uh, those time frames that used to take two, three months have really been expanded to five or six. And that's critical to, or that underscores the reason why it's critical to get the process started as soon as possible. Well, that's critical because the time on market for a piece of property is now longer than it's ever been. So basically you're saying by the time everything is said and done, you're almost looking at a year before that property is sold. Potentially, yes. To the extent that there can be any type of, um, to the extent that there can be any type of uh, beginning negotiation with the bank, obviously the bank will not sign off on a um, on a short sale until it sees a signed contract with a bona fide good faith offer. Um, to the extent that offers and between contracts or properties being listed and properties going into contract has taken much longer, at least in my marketplace of Manhattan. But I believe that uh, going forward, I think that there will be a lot more transactions that are occurring as a result of a short sale. What happens next? You've got somebody who wants to buy your home. Then what? It, does the bank come in and dictate the procedure? Or does the FHA dictate the procedure of everything that gets done as far as the settlement or the next step in the process? And this is after a contract has been signed by both parties. Well, that contract that was signed by the buyer and the seller is going to have a number of contingencies within that contract. There's going to be a contingency that the buyer and seller are aware that the contract is subject to the lender's approval. So that's one contingency. The bank basically uh, has the opportunity to quash the deal if it doesn't like what it will ultimately yield from the short sale proceeds. No, the second contingency in the contract of sale will be a seller's contingency, whereby the seller, if it's not satisfied with what the lender requires from, it, from the seller, they will uh, have the opportunity to cancel the deal because the seller can always elect to go through the foreclosure process in lieu of facilitating a short sale for basically the bank's benefit. The seller is not going to realize any proceeds from the sale, um, so it's really doing its best job to save its credit rating or its credit report and credit score by offering a great service to the bank, which is to avoid the, the risk and the expense of a foreclosure. And the third contingency that's going to be involved in the contract is going to be a contingency that relates to the buyer, where the buyer will be able to release themselves from the contract if the lender has not approved the short sale transaction within a specific amount of time. Now what happens if you buy new construction, you sign the contract, and you've basically moved in but yet the rest of the building has not sold. The builder goes belly up. What happens to your property in a situation like that? Well, to the extent that there's a, there are a lot of new construction properties in New York um, where someone has purchased some property and there remain a number of units that are unsold. 
to the extent if the sponsor is no longer capable of making payments on the unsold units, generally speaking, most offering plans allow the sponsor an unencumbered right to rent those units. And generally speaking, if the offering plan has been met with, uh, has met attorney general approval and units have sold, to the extent that there are unsold units, it's more likely than not that the sponsor will elect to rent those units to cover their operating expense, the monthly common charges. So you go back to what is the worth of your apartment. It seems like immediately it has gone down. And it's like, what do you do next? Do you ride out the wave to see if the rest of the building's going to go or if it's rental? Or what are people doing? Well, generally speaking, people are not electing, well, banks certainly are not electing to settle their loans for less than what they're owed in the events that a property has diminished in value. The only reason why a bank would settle for less than what it's owed is if they have no likelihood of continued mortgage payments. Um, but what happens if someone has purchased into a building of, say, 100 units and 50 of them end up being rental units and the remaining 50 are owner-occupied units, certainly I think there has been a diminishment in the value of that property. Um, but that's diminishment in value of property by, by and of itself is not a sufficient enough reason for a bank to entertain a short sale. Generally speaking, with this respect to a short sale, there needs to be a few things that, that are going on. Number one, the property needs to be, have declined in value so that there is no longer equity that allows for the loan to be paid off in full. That would be number one. And number two, there needs to be some sort of hardship by the owner of the property that renders them now unable to continue making their loan payments, whether that be loss of income from investment sources or that's loss of income from uh, loss of a job. Whatever the case may be, it's a hardship, an economic hardship coupled with a diminishment in value. What kind of verification do you have to provide the bank to show that you are doing a short sale so that they will go along with it? The volume of information that a borrower puts together when they endeavor to take out a loan is pretty much the same type of information that the bank is going to be looking for when it concedes to facilitating a short sale. Specifically, they're going to look at, there's going to be a letter that's called the hardship letter that's going to briefly detail what's going on in terms of why the owner's economic circumstances have changed. They're going to look for a history, the uh, statements of investment accounts and bank accounts uh, for the last two or three months, uh, basically suggesting where um, the resources of the seller are, if there are any. If a person has lost their job but they have a million dollars sitting in their savings account, the bank is not going to concede to take less than what they're owed. Um, but if the, the re, if the circumstances are such that the borrower can prove they have lost their job, there's a termination letter, there's a uh, economic hardship letter that's, um, that has supported by documentation that represents that they are, are suffering an economic harm, the bank is aware that the sales proceeds are not going to be sufficient to settle the loan in full. And the bank is also made aware that the resources outside of the property that the seller might have are insufficient for the seller to make continued payments. That's when a, a lender will contemplate a short sale. Nowadays, people are buying a lot of second homes, and they're also doing home equity loans. So let's address the second home. Does this apply to a second home also, or does that get handled differently? Well, actually, it applies to, it applies to any property on which there's a mortgage. It could apply to second homes, a primary residence. It could also apply to pure investment property. Um, the circumstances under which a lender can go after a Per, the, the lender's perspective is going to be different if it's a principal resident as opposed to an investment property. On investment property, generally speaking, the lender is going to look for 
uh, continued payments after the short sale, typically uh, because the nature of an investment property purchase is different than a primary purchase or primary residence purchase, excuse me. What about a home equity loan? Now that's the second mortgage on a piece of property. How does that get handled? The home equity line of credit is in secondary position to the first mortgage. Someone who's taken out that, let's use the same example, a million dollar property with a $900,000 $900, of indebtedness. There may be an $800,000 first loan and a $100,000 second loan. The first loan, the lender of the first loan, after a foreclosure, would not be able to go after the borrower for, anything, for any deficiency or shortfall. The lender of the second loan, the home equity line of credit loan, would have recourse against the borrower if the foreclosure proceeds were insufficient to pay off the loan. That being said, when one negotiates a short sale, you're negotiating simultaneously with both the first and second lenders to come up with an agreement that's of benefit to all parties. You have been in your home and you've built up some equity. You've been in it for quite a while. Does that get handled any different? Well, if you have equity, then you're not contemplating a short sale because what has to happen for a short sale to be contemplated is that the value, of the, the value of the mortgage is now higher than the net sales, the net proceeds realized from the sale. If there is positive equity in the property, then you wouldn't have to negotiate with the bank to settle for less than what's owed. The bank is going to, um, and just to touch on one of your earlier questions, you mentioned um, who controls the process. And the process is really controlled by the bank. The bank will require HUD approval on every, uh, which basically the HUD form is a form that details where all payments are made at the closing table um, with respect to every amount that's paid by seller and every amount that's paid by borrower, uh, or by purchaser, excuse me. One prerequisite to a short sale is that the seller realizes absolutely no proceeds from the sale. Gone through, you've sold your property. What are the tax consequences of this whole thing? Well, thankfully, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act of 2007 basically provided that in the event that someone has been forgiven some debt, the way that the IRS interpreted that is that it was income. Although it wasn't income realized, if someone owed me or someone owes $100,000 and then no longer owes $100,000 because that debt has been forgiven, the IRS has looked at that as um, cancel forgiveness of debt, uh, and that's a tax-triggering event. With the Mortgage Debt Relief Act of 2007, if the property served as a primary residence for two out of the last five years and the amount of money that's been forgiven is less than two million dollars, then there is no tax consequence for what, the, for, the, for what the bank has forgiven in terms of the short sale. So if using that example noted earlier, where a million dollar property was, had a $900,000 mortgage, the fair market value is $700,000 currently, for the bank to forgive that loan uh, and settle for $700,000, there would be a $200,000 um, debt that had been forgiven, upon, which would serve as income. Um, but that's been changed with the Mortgage Debt Relief Act of 2007, and there would be no taxes owed. That's a very big incentive for people to pursue a short sale um, in lieu of a foreclosure. A foreclosure is a really, a, it's a really, des it's as comparable to a, or it's as deleterious to a credit report as a bankruptcy would be. Let's say you do a short sale. Your life turns around in a couple of years. How does that affect you getting a mortgage the next time around? Well, I would be absolutely uh, dishonest if I suggested that a short sale is not a blemish on a credit report. It is a blemish. Uh, essentially, a short sale is typically reported as a debt that's been paid but settled for less than the outstanding amount. However, it is substantially different than a foreclosure, which is comparable to a bankruptcy. Because, the, um, because what a uh, short sale is essentially doing is it's acknowledging that the seller 
who has no motivation, really, because they're, they're realizing zero proceeds from the sale. Their motivation is principally to salvage their credit report and credit score. And there was a quote from the CEO of the Fair Isaacs Corporation, uh, who was interviewed recently on CNN, and his comment was that short sales, as FICO scores progress, short sales will be reflected differently um, and not as, um, not as negatively impacting one's credit report. How long will that last on your credit report? Because a bankruptcy lasts for seven years. That's correct, and a foreclosure lasts a similar term. How long will a uh, short sale be reflected on a credit report? I am not aware of the answer to that question. However, I do know that there has been an acknowledgement by the Fair Isaacs Corporation, which are the people who put together the FICO score, that short sales will be deemed to be less than a foreclosure. One should make note that the, probably the best thing that someone can do with regard to if they anticipate that they're not going to be able to make their loan payments is to begin the negotiations as early as possible. Because separate and apart from a foreclosure or a short sale, payments that are not made or payments that are made late will by themselves have a negative impact on a credit score. The best way to proceed is to never have a late payment. John, thank you for joining us today. It has been great learning all about foreclosures, short sales. I have learned quite a bit and I'm a real estate broker. I hope you've also learned something, and if you have any questions for John or myself, don't hesitate to write us here at The Woman's Connection. Bye now.